Vertebrates. These are all pretty much holoblastic, except for the zebrafish, which is meroblastic. Um, oh no, and chick, sorry. Zebrafish and gallus, these are uh, meroblastic. Frog is holoblastic. Mice, humans, mammals, we're all holoblastic. Now, uh, today we're also going to start talking about gastrulation. One of the important things in many of the formation of the embryos is once the cells start undergoing cleavage, um, there is typically the formation of what's called a blastocele, a blastocele, which is the cells will pull fluid from the outside environment and push it in to create this, um, pretty much this uh, um, vacancy where there are no cells a large gap of fluid-filled area, which we call the blastocele. This is essential for the uh, um, patterning of the three germ layers because scientists have shown that if you remove the blastocele and the ectoderm comes in contact with these vegetal pole cells, these will not become ectoderm anymore. There has to be a separation. Why do you think that is? What might be something that, why there needs to be this huge gap or separation. Paracrine signaling, there you go. So paracrine signaling, remember, is indiscriminate where it spreads it out. So there needs to be this gap so that these tissues up here are not uh, induced by the paracrine signaling of these cells down here. And you'll find this to be the case in uh, a lot of embryos. There's always there's this blastocele that is necessary for not only the separation so that paracrine signaling can't affect certain cells, but also in the gastrulation or the movement of the cells, it provides mobility for the cells to be able to move around. It gives them some space and some flexibility in being able to move in that environment. So that happens fairly early on in the cleavage process as well of the xenopus is that they will start filling this area full of fluid, which forms the blastocele. In fact, this happens too we look at the sea urchins, after several stages of cleavage in the sea urchins, it also will form a blastocele. So here, after the first few stages, you can see the blastocele forming right here, right in the middle of that. In fact, it forms so that the cells are on the periphery and they have this huge blastocele in the middle during sea urchin gastrulation. Okay, so even sea urchins, as we'll see, as in chickens and whatnot, you, you get blastocels all over the place. The entire embryo we call a blastula. Okay, so this is just some terminology you should be familiar with. Blastomeres are the cells. Blastocel is this fluid-filled area, and the entire thing is the blastula. So zebrafish. One of the events after fertilization in the zebrafish is you have these actin filaments, which are part of the cytoskeleton, that will actually squeeze a portion of the uh, oocyte, and it forms this non yolky area in the animal pole. And that is where the embryo or where cleavage is going to occur. So it's meroblastic because, again, it's only going to form in a small area. It's not going to encompass the entire yolk. Uh, in fact, it'll squeeze it so that you get this little bubble forming on top, just like that right there. This is discoidal meroblastic cleavage. So meroblastic because it does not include the entire embryo. You can see here, it almost looks like bread. <laughs> Down here beneath this area right there, this does not undergo cleavage at all. All the cleavage is going to occur right on top of this yolk area. So none of the this yolk area is going to undergo cleavage. Now, doesn't mean that there's not any nuclei in here. In fact, that's a critical part in the gastrulation is you have some syncytial nuclei that do not get sequestered initially into the cells. Okay? So there, there are nuclei that are going to be within the yolky area that don't actually have uh, uh, form into various blastomeres. Okay? So that's one of the activation events of the zebrafish uh, is once fertilization occurs, then it just the, the cytoskeleton squeezes it, creates this little bubble on top, and that's where uh, um, cleavage can occur uh, in that area. Between the top area and the bottom area, we have what's called the yolk syncytial layer, okay, where you're going to have a lot of these nuclei sitting just beneath. 
And these do play a role in the patterning of the overall embryo. Eventually, what will happen is the cells will envelop the entire yolk, will actually surround the yolk, and then start drawing nutrients from the yolk. So the cells will develop early on on top, and then they'll eventually form this shield that will surround the yolk and start pulling nutrients uh, uh, from the yolk itself. Now, chick development. Chick development is the closest in terms of patterning to human development. Yeah, even though chicks are not mammals, you know, um, if you look at a mouse and how it develops, it's pretty weird. By comparison, in terms of how the germ layers get set up. So just keep that in mind. One of the things that's, that is really important about chick early development is the stages, the, at least the initial stages of chick development pattern almost identically to human development um, in terms of how cleavage occurs and how you form the epiblast and the hypoblast and things of that sort. All right, now here's one of the things. Fertilization occurs before the egg is laid, okay? So the hen and the rooster got to do their thing before the hit, uh, lays its egg because what happens is as soon as the hen creates the calcium shell around the egg, you can't fertilize it anymore. So in fact, fertilization has to occur, and then, and then the actual egg starts forming around the albumin, the shell, the calcium. Um, it's going to form around that. So fertilization becomes internally. In fact, by the time that the chicken lays the egg, it's already undergone several stages of cleavage um, in the early development. So even if you pull a freshly hatched egg, it's already very much progressed down the developmental process. And then we can incubate it further and look at certain stages beyond that point. Again, this is meroblastic. It sits just on top of the yolk. It's not, it's not identical to zebrafish in that you don't get this bubbling up of an area. It just kind of starts dividing right on top of the top layer of the yolk. There's no kind of pushing of a membrane up. It just takes place right on top of it. So it's similar to zebrafish in that it's meroblastic, but it's not similar in that you don't form this bubble on top of it like you do with the zebrafish. Um, so if you look at it, you have two main areas. And the two main areas are what we call the area pellucida, which is the lighter area, and the area opaca, which is the more opaque or kind of like looking through a foggy mirror type of thing. Uh, area. Now, the biggest difference here is this right here, this area, the area opaca, this is where the cell undergoes cleavage and actually starts forming all of the, uh, uh, you know, blastomeres uh, around the nuclei. And it just keeps sequestering and making more and making more and using up the nutrients and just starts building up on in that area. Now, the reason why this area is called the area pellucida is because early on, these cells will then start pulling fluid in and guess what they form just beneath it? The blastocyl. So we sometimes call it the subgerminal cavity or subgerminal space, but that's really the blastocyl. That's that area that's going to form kind of that separate barrier. barrier okay? So it'll actually, that's why this area is much clearer. When you look under a microscope, you can actually inject some ink down here, and that helps you see the uh, white cells or the embryo itself. So the area opaca is the, are the cells that are touching the yolk, and the area pellucida is the area that has this blastocyl just beneath it. Okay? Now, these cells right here are going to entirely form all three germ layers. This is what we call the epiblast. Okay? So the epiblast will become the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. That's the fate of these cells. The reason why I emphasize that is because during the cleavage process and then subsequent gastrulation, there's a second layer of cells that forms just beneath it called the hypoblast. But the hypoblast does not become part of the embryo. In fact, the main role of the hypoblast is for secreting paracrine factors for the patterning of the three germ layers from the epiblast. That's its role. The hypoblast essentially is this sheet of cells just beneath the epiblast and they secrete various paracrine factors at various times, and that's going to pattern 
or start influencing the formation of the three germ layers from the epiblast. So the hypoblast does secrete the paracrine factors that will induce this epiblast to start becoming tissues. In fact, when we look at fate maps, we can actually say, hey, the cells from this region are going to contribute to the heart, the ones from this region are going to contribute to the uh, endothelial lining, and so on and so forth. We know where the cells will eventually end up due to fate mapping. So we know that these early stages of uh, cleavage even have inductive signaling by the hypoblast. We form a two-layer blastoderm as well for human development. Okay, so here's the blastocele. In that, the, that space in between the epiblast and the hypoblast is what we technically call the blastocele. That's that fluid-filled area that allows for uh, the movement of cells as well as these inductive events. In the initial stages, too, there are various regions of the embryo on what we call an organizer. And the reason why they're called the organizer is because they're a group of cells that will condition other cells on what fate they're supposed to take on. They release paracrine factors uh, as they move around, and as cells come in contact with them, it causes these inductive events that are necessary for the patterning. So each of these organisms that we're going to talk about will show you where the organizer starts forming and its role in gastrulation. Let's talk about mice. Now, the initial stages of mice actually are more akin to you and I in terms of the initial stages of cleavage. Obviously, humans don't start out uh, with, with the yolk and the cells undergoing cleavage. So when I say that this, uh, uh, the cleavage of, um, and gastrulation of chickens is more similar to humans, I'm talking more about this stage right here with the epiblast and the hypoblast. However, in terms of the initial stages of cleavage from the uh, single-celled uh, zygote, Mice, again, are more similar to humans in that it's holoblastic, not meroblastic, so it encompasses the entire, uh, entire zygote. And it undergoes, you know, basically multiple cleavage events and, and uh, uh, rotate, or in this case, this is isolithal, which means that all of the uh, cells are going to be um, uh, the exact same size. And the same thing is true for, for humans. The cells are all the same size when they undergo cleavage. So you don't get different size uh, uh, blastomeres like you do with xenopus or sea urchins and things like that. Again, you can see right here, this area, there's the blastocele. So this forms early on in mice. This also forms early on in humans, where we have a blastocele forming. So you get kind of this layer on the outside that will form the extra embryonic tissue, where you get implantation into the uterus. And then you get these cells in the middle called the inner cell mass. That's what becomes you and I. That's what becomes the embryo proper, as we call it. So that inner cell mass group of cells, even after three or four days, are still undifferentiated. These cells can split, and that's where you get identical twins coming from. And each one of those split masses can become their own embryo. And due to the fact that they've been undergoing mitosis this whole time, they are genetically identical to one another, which is why you get identical twins. All right. So um, again, in mammals, what's interesting, and this is different between amphibians versus mammals. Amphibians, it, you get them on the same plane initially. But for mammals, you get it cut once, and then one of them's going to go this way, and the other one's going to go perpendicular to it. So that's just how the cleavage pattern works. Eventually, after about eight cells form, they start increasing the cell adhesion molecules, and they come super compacted together, in fact, to the point where you can hardly tell one cell from another. Once the cells compact together and you start forming more of them, these cells are going to pull in water through osmosis and form the blastocele. Okay, so that fluid fills space that's necessary. The cells on the perimeter of this, uh, what we call the trophoblast, these will become the extra embryonic tissue, the placenta, the umbilical cord, whereas the cells in the middle, the inner cell mass, that becomes the actual embryo itself. 